Okay, so we'll make this session informal, as informal as possible, and then um, uh, and as interactive as possible, since it's an afternoon, we all you guys to fall asleep, uh, listening to the talk. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself, I you guys to introduce yourselves. My name is uh, Ken Ming. Uh, I'm a member of parliament for Serga, not too far away from here. Um, it's a constituency of about 100, almost 140,000 workers now. Uh, 50% Chinese, 40% Malay. This is my first term. I was elected in 2013. Uh, I have a PhD in political science, a uh, master's and a bachelor's in economics. Uh, I'm not an environmental scientist, just to clarify. Uh, but the reason why uh, I thought it might be useful uh, for me to talk to you guys is that I'm one of the few MPs who actually cover environmental policy. Uh, it's not a very sexy topic because it's very technical. Uh, most MPs ignore it because there are other more relevant matters in the short term for them to look at. Uh, but since uh, you know, I have an interest in environmental issues, uh, I thought that this is an important portfolio for me to cover. Uh, and uh, there are different areas of uh, environment, the environmental portfolio that I'm interested in, which I'll share with you all later. But before I you know, go on, can I just ask you guys to introduce yourself, tell me what you're doing now, uh, studying, working, where, and then also uh, what you hope to achieve by going to Marrakesh. Yeah, I don't need a session. Alright, um, I'm Nalina, and I'm currently in my second year law in UTM. And what I hope to do... Who that? UTM or UITM? UTM. Huh? UTM. Oh, UKM, okay, okay. Originally from uh, Klang Valley, KL Slamo? Uh, no, I'm a fellow in Klang Oh, okay. So you're a second year law student at UKM. Yeah, yeah UKM yeah. also is a constituency yeah, under part. But I don't get invited to the university very often. <laughs> 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 for obvious reasons. Okay, so you want to know how policies are done, especially on environmental issues. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so hi guys, I'm Nacha. <laughs> um, uh, second year, just finished my second year uh, in law in Hope University, transferring to Cardiff this September. Uh, I'm currently interning at Penang Institute under Dr. Hong. Uh, what I hope to achieve at COP22 is um, I want to observe a little closely on the LMDC negotiations, the role they play, because I think the music plays a big role. Um, I'd also love to see how uh, the youth activism movements say mobilize in COP22. I heard that's quite a fascinating thing uh, to be part of. Uh, to just throw myself into this policy making around that. Who here knows what uh, LMDC is? Uh? Anyone here? Other than Asha? Oh, yes. The, the light is uh, Okay. And uh, I'm Mugun. What, what did you study then? A law. Yeah. And what I hope to achieve in COP uh, 22 is to understand the negotiation process in, in real time better. And also quite similar to what I said. Um, yeah. So you'll be doing your, your CLP? Yeah, most probably. So, yeah. Okay. Right, so we have three lawyers here. Okay. Most senior. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I'm Environmental consultant, currently practice with uh, environment, uh, ERE consulting. I have, I have a specific interest in uh, solid waste management and stakeholder engagement in terms of like, social economic studies. And uh, the reason I joined NYD is because I'd like to understand a little bit more about how uh, climate change is being. So you studied uh, environmental engineering? I studied, uh, my first degree was in uh, microbiology and then I read a book about climate wars and that kind of uh, initiated me something about uh, a career in environmental uh, consulting this, this, this field and then I pursued my uh, master's in environmental management in UTM and after that, uh, while doing that I was 
also doing some risk management, managing the landfills in Johor, public lands and stuff. And after that, I quite, uh, uh, quite lucky because I joined the, uh, the Young Environmental Lease uh, Internship. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program, it's an award by Answers Malaysia, and then they sent me to uh, an incinerator, an integrated incinerator in Kaohsiung that generates uh, it's a WTE insulator, they convert uh, the, the heat, the waste energy, to energy, yes, yeah. and then they generate electricity. Yeah, so a bit, a bit more interesting than that. We can talk about rubbish later. Yonat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since uh, I think uh, you know, you're probably the one with uh, the most practical experience here, you want to tell your, your microbiology degree was in UPM as well? It was in USM. USM. Okay. So are you Penang? Penang lang? Or? I'm actually Hokkien from Stairwan, but then I got it. Oh, okay. okay. So, uh, uh, do you all know what uh, uh, an environmental consultant does? Can you all guess? Yeah, yeah, I think yes. you will know. Lang. Okay, yeah. Uh, I used to intern with PRM. Yeah, I was with them for architecture. So you want to tell them what environmental consulting uh, in this boring <laughs> job is <laughs> it's actually uh, we are helping some client, our clients in terms of developers or uh, you know, some contractors to comply with the uh, environmental standards in the way of doing uh, environmental impact assessment, which is the planning stage before they start any, any, any project. Yeah, and then during the project and after the project, during the operation of the, of the project, we help them to comply. Uh, using environmental management plan, and so this is like in terms of uh, in terms of water quality, air quality, uh, discharge, uh, noise, uh, flood mitigation. Yes, uh, all, all of the mitigation measures and mitigation. yeah, it's, and we help, we propose some PMPs and best management practices. Besides that, my company also do some conservation policy stuff. Yeah, my colleague was working on the Rainbow of Life project and Dr. Hong actually paid us a visit in last year. He was asked for the back now. Project can perform do better. Anyone of you here know about the Rainbow of Life project? Yeah, I'll talk, talk a little bit about that as well. But that one is Less directly, uh, it's less direct impact in terms of uh, what you guys uh, will be discussing and talking about. Yeah, and uh, uh, Yari does a bit of social impact assessment as well. Yes. Yeah, you want to tell us what that is? Uh, so, for some, some prescribed uh, activities, certain developments, they have to assess the social economy area within the project uh, site or like uh, maybe uh, the zone of influence we want to treat kilometers or five kilometers it depends and this kind of depends where the project site is whether it's a sensitive area or whether it's, whether it's a, uh, in the project area and normally we will have to look into the, uh, the social economic context in terms of uh, like uh, we will carry out survey on the ground get feedbacks and success also we uh, will depends on the statistics that is given by the Department of Statistics and the local government, like what, how is the population uh, distribution, how, how, what, how is the ratio distribution, and we come up with the social impact assessment uh, report, uh, which is uh, sometimes supplementary to the environmental impact assessment. Sometimes So when I first met Kelvin, uh, Yari was doing a social impact assessment in my area in Sedang because the MRT second line is going to be going through Sedang. So they, they had a stakeholder engagement period where they talked to the different uh, residents and then listened to some of their concerns and then uh, tried to uh, give some, uh, use that as a feedback to give to the, their clients. Uh, 
your clients will be MRT. PDP, PDP or MRT? PDP. Okay. So they are. <laughs> yes, I think it's PDP. Yes. So their yeah, clients will be the, the main contractor that's in charge of the entire MRT project, which is uh, a, a consortium uh, comprising of our MMC company. So these are two big conglomerates. Uh, Gamuda, you may have heard of them through property development. They also own some of the toll roads here in Malaysia as well, including the smart uh, MMC is a, uh, also another conglomerate. They do things like Major project doing uh, uh, the Kita project, which is uh, uh, sewage centralization. One of the many things. That okay, Jasmine. Hi everyone, I'm from Welcome to my tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your base is a Muni, right? Yeah. So you'll be able to see some of the politics in action, right? the politics of science in action. Uh, where's your hometown? I'm this year, Ampang. Uh, Mama, your hometown is... Yeah. It's just here. Uh, hi, I'm Zun Yang. Uh, I just finished my first level, first year of eight levels in College of Java. Um, I'm applying to uni right now, and I'm going to study economics because I'm a very good scholar. Um, what? interests me in this is because as an economist you in Bangladesh you are more into public policy, economic policy, and I'm interested to see how climate change can be translated in the social economic context. Can you think of any examples that uh... climate change and public policy? Um, mostly it's not. It won't be like very hundred percent pure uh, climate change. It's more like you apply the economy of it. It's not like very pure climate kind of change. Uh, can you point to anything in this room that has uh, that has an impact on climate change? Something that you're using right now. Uh, and how, how does that, from a public policy standpoint, how does how does that uh, impact climate change? And then you also have to like kind of say from the individual standpoint. Standpoint, they want to sell stuff, and then you have to, and then when you export stuff, it's a country's revenue as a whole. So it can't be like purely on the same term. I guess I could take any. Okay. I mean, I was thinking more of like uh, uh, when, when you switch on the account, what do you, what do you consume? Uh, correct. So, how do you generate electricity? Uh, how does Tanaka generate electricity? Uh, okay. So that, you know. That has an impact on climate, climate right? okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, um, uh, let, me, let me just get a sense of uh, the, the sort of like a level of exposure in this room. Uh, anyone, anyone here knows what INDCs are? Yeah. What are INDCs? They are, uh, well, they're called NDCs now, right? National, national de nationally determined conditions. So these are the policies that so what what is uh what was uh, uh the objective of the of the paris uh, meeting of cop 21 and then what was achieved i mean you you, you, you can give a summary like, what was the objective first what was the big headline objective like? You all know what's the headline? I mean, you should know this, right? Since you're going to COP twenty twenty two, and COP twenty two is a lead up from COP twenty one. Do you know what's the what's the headline objective? What I've read up is to get all the countries to agree to for at least Okay. 
uh, what, what is the objective for trying to get all these countries to sign up to these uh, nationally dependent contributions? That's one headline objective. Uh, to keep the expenditure below, rising below to reduce So that was the big thing, right? So did they manage to achieve that? Yeah. They did? I'm not sure, but I, I still have to get to 5 percent of all the countries to that. I that is the only thing I should be worried about. Okay. Any other views on that? Did they like did they have an agreement that whatever that was going to be uh, agreed uh, that whatever that was agreed on in Paris was sufficient to limit uh, rise rise in global uh, temperature by two percent uh, sorry by two degrees in the next. Uh, What's the consensus? You can Google. Please, Google. I think in Mandon, the US, they didn't ratify. So the US, one of the biggest players, they didn't ratify. They didn't. So that's a very strong message. They haven't, like, they haven't. Yeah, they haven't. Because then we have to go through Congress. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can go and check on, on your computers. Uh, the, they came to a consensus that whatever they agreed on would this point in time only managed to limit the rise in global temperature by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, you can verify that. Uh, that was why I read. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, part and parcel of a larger battle uh, that features, uh, largely speaking, I'm uh, generalizing here. Uh, on the one hand, developed countries, and then on the other, developing countries. Why is there a contestation between the two sides? Developed and the developing countries in terms of climate change. Do you all know the, the large narrative there, or the larger narrative? It's because the developing countries, yeah, because the developing countries, uh, it would be taking a chunk out of their economy to, uh, and they lack the green technologies that are needed to reach that level. So they mean that they, that it's going to take a bigger chunk of their economy, given the higher price. So. I think they also depend on the developed countries to, to offer uh, techno green technology transfer and uh, terms and of funds. Yeah. Anyone else to add? One more thing is that the developed countries have already been uh, sort of polluting, so they've got to take responsibility for all that. Anyone else to add? I think, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the contention. So all the developing developed countries say, look, you have to introduce mitigation measures. So remember the term mitigation. Basically, measures that you need to take to uh, reduce your, emission, uh, your emissions or reduce the rate of your emissions. Right? Uh, there's a difference between the two. I hope you all get it. Uh, um, the developed countries, the developing countries will say that, hey, look, you had your industrialization period, you polluted during that time, you didn't have to introduce any mitigation measures, you already contributed X amount, uh, whatever that can be measured in terms of, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of global warming, uh, your, your, whatever your carbon emissions have been in the past. So why do we have to get uh, punished now, whereas you didn't get punished? Okay, so that's one. And the second thing is that, okay, if you want us to uh, have these mitigation measures, you need to help us with payment or technology transfer. That's where the green climate fund comes in. Yeah, I'll talk more about it. Uh, and then there's also another thing which you all need to be aware of is in terms of uh, terminology. Anyone of you have heard of the word adaptation before in terms of climate change? Jasmine, what is adaptation? Adaptation is how a family has to uh, adapt to the climate change. What's that word right now? Adjust. Uh, something that's more directly uh, hit at the cost of uh, which is a more direct cost to the developing countries in terms of adaptation would be what? Huh? Rising sea. Yeah. 
So if there's a rising rise, rise sea level, you need to spend money to build sea walls. Uh, uh, another effect would be because you know you have uh, more and uh, more irregular weather patterns, you maybe have more flooding in places that didn't used to have flooding. Uh, in other places where uh, you used to have rain, now there's less rain, so you have to adapt to those new conditions. So you have to spend money on that. Right. So uh, for developing countries, uh, you know it's a balancing act that they have to play in terms of adaptation and mitigation. So the larger narrative that you all will hear. Uh, now until COP22, and you'll hear that in COP22 as well. And as we you know, I've talked about in the past, is um, we need to pay costs in terms of adaptation, uh, costs which perhaps as developing countries we are not as able compared to developed countries to pay. So you also have to take that into account because that will impact how we can spend money on mitigation measures, which is what the developed countries want to do. So these are the two balancing acts that we need to play. Uh, where does Malaysia stand? Are we a developed or a developing country? Moving towards development. So we are in a tricky spot. Uh, are, are you all going to meet Prof. Gudia? Any, any we want to. Yeah. We are sending you for communication emails. You ask, uh, ask Adrian to arrange. Uh, or you want me to arrange? Uh, I'm going quite well. So have you, do you all know who Prof. Gudia is? Heard of him before, you guys? So he's a very important uh, player in terms of negotiating on, the, on behalf of uh, uh, LDMCs. Uh, but uh, you have to be cognizant of the fact that when he's negotiating, he's negotiating on behalf of all the like minded countries. And the biggest uh, like minded countries in that grouping would be what? China. And? India. Yes. Those are the two big ones. Huh? Malaysia is sort of like, you know, at this point in time, maybe. We're being positioned on, on, you know, on the developing country side, but we're a very, very small country. Right? So uh, his interest is, you have to realize that it's not necessarily from a Malaysian standpoint. Right? It's not to say that he's not patriotic or whatever, you know, but it's just that his, the goal, his position at the negotiating table is to represent uh, those uh, developing countries. Right? Uh, and I think it's important for you guys to talk to him so that you can get a sense of uh, where he's coming from and then also perhaps uh, you know, ask him questions in regards to Malaysia's own position. Because our problem, our challenge is that uh, as we move towards the status of a developing country, a lot of the, a lot of the benefits that, uh, that COP21 uh, you know, would be able to give to developing countries in terms of funding and financing may not be available to Malaysia if let's say we become a developed and in fact, we may actually have the worst of both worlds in the sense that if we become a developed country, not only do, do we uh, have to uh, not be able to access certain funding sources for, for mitigation measures, but we may have to contribute towards uh, that pool of money. Right? So this is something that you all need to be cognizant of. Yeah? That uh, when you go there, uh, you observe, and you also have to realise that some of the, 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 the challenges that Malaysia faces as a country as we move towards a developed country status, which is what the, the, uh, the, you know, the official government narrative is, you know, 2020 would be a developed country, uh, in fact, maybe even earlier by income, uh, from income perspective. Okay. Uh, so have you all actually read Malaysia's INDC? INDC? Have you all? Okay. So what is inside there? Is, uh, I would say it is some it, 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 it is contributions in terms of promises that Malaysia made that they, that they want to achieve, but I would say it is loosely uh, written and uh, it, it refers back to a lot of the uh, our existing policies, but then there are still a little, a little bit like loopholes here and there that uh, they need to clarify how. Okay, so this is Malaysia's INDC, which was submitted, submitted quite late in the game. Uh, I think probably about a day or two before the official deadline. Uh, so the base here is 2005. Uh, and 35% uh, uh, is unconditional. That means Malaysia will, will make that uh, commitment 
regardless of the funding that it gets from uh, you know, international sources. And then 10% is contingent upon climate finance. Right? So these are the things. Uh, there are some very technical stuff here in terms of uh, carbon emissions like, and electricity uh, stuff. You can get into it depending on your own interests. Uh, probably someone like Jasmine would want to get into it more. Maybe some of the lawyers may not want to look at it so, so uh, closely. Um, the gases coverage the different sectors. Okay. And then uh, the planning process to get there. There's a lot of these uh, policies that you can go and uh, download and uh, look at. Uh, some of these assumptions. Uh, okay. So let's let's maybe take it take it a step back before you go into uh, uh, some of these technical terms and technical areas, right? Let's just throw some ideas. Huh? <clears throat> in terms of uh, in terms of Malaysia's contribution or what Malaysia can do use uh, either the rate of growth of carbon emissions or the absolute amount of carbon emissions. Uh, let's just do bring some brainstorming uh, and then uh, I'll use that as a platform to uh, get into some of the data sources and the discussions. Uh, what can we do? We can throw out different ideas. Oh, okay, maybe I should, uh, let's, let's, work it, let's work at it from a different angle. What are some of the major contributions, uh, contributors to carbon emissions in Malaysia? Deforestation. Okay, deforestation. Okay, uh, coal power plants. Okay. Others? Okay, uh, factories, yes, waste. How does waste contribute? So, actually, the, the waste part is uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, since you were in SWM before, um, how, how does, let me broaden the discussion, how do you think waste contributes to uh, emissions, either directly or indirectly? This is just to tickle your brain a little bit. Okay, Malaysia doesn't have incinerators. Or no, no, no large scale incinerators and anyway. But okay, but if let's say Malaysia had incinerators, how, how would it contribute? Okay. So, but incinerators, you can have scrubbing technologies where you can take out carbon, right, from the process use the level of emissions or, or uh, CO2 emissions, right? That, that would be inside some of the EIA requirements that they would have. Uh, oh, let me clarify. Uh, Malaysia doesn't have large-scale incinerators. We have four small-scale incinerators. Uh, uh, I think nearly all of which have uh, failed to operate the way it's supposed to operate. Yeah, um, one in Bangkok, one in Tioman, one in uh, Nakawi, and one in Cameron. I visited the one in Panko before. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, but what is what about the alternative? If you don't burn the rubbish, where do you throw it? Okay. So, is landfill a source of uh, uh, emissions of greenhouse gases? What's that? So the environmental scientists would know, right? Which is worse in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas effect, CH4 or CO2? It's much worse, right? Probably about four times or three or four times. Uh, what, what, why, does, uh, why does the landfill create methane? Okay. So, but but uh, are there any ways to mitigate Emissions of uh, methane from landfill. Okay. Whether you would like to design landfill as a secondary landfill, which you can extract uh, the methane gas either for power or you know, generating or whatsoever, or you would like to 
just leave it there like this, uh, more than 200 so called uh, dump site. You just leave it there and then you know, this is what uh, most of our, our landfills in Malaysia is, right? And just leave it there and then just wait for fire to come. Okay, so uh, I assume that, not taking you out of the question, uh, sorry. <laughs> I assume that five of you here have never visited a landfill, right? So I think you all should go and visit a landfill, a sanitary landfill. In the past in Malaysia, our landfills were basically not sanitary. What do I mean by not sanitary? Uh, you dig a hole in the ground and you dump the rubbish inside. Right? What's the problem with that? Uh, when, you, when, your, when your rubbish truck goes around to collect rubbish, uh, usually you can, sometimes you'll be able to see it leaving a stench, especially in terms of uh, water. Uh, the water that is discharged is called leachate. It's very stinky, it's very black. Uh, and when you dig a hole in the ground, dump your rubbish inside, the leachate will seep out into the groundwater or, and find itself into water sources. So it's really, really bad. Um, one of the oldest landfills in KL is in this place called Jinjiang. Uh, have you been there before? No. You heard about it? <laughs> okay. Uh, it, is, uh, it was an uh, unsanitary landfill, like most landfills in Malaysia then. And uh, basically what happened was that the government gave a contract to, uh, to Saipa, uh, it's, a, it's a listed company, to basically clean up the landfill. Uh, what happened was that they tried to clean up the rubbish there, and then they plant green stuff on top, and then uh, it's now basically a hill that you rarely, you, you rarely get to smell uh, you know, smelly stuff coming out from there. But, if you go to the bottom of the hill, you will be able to see the black discharge still coming up. Uh, I, I, I visited that place once uh, because, uh, because of an uh, initiative that was part of, right? So, uh, going back to uh, methane. Okay. Uh, for a sanitary landfill, what happens? Sanitary landfill, uh, if you, uh, it depends on the cell, it depends on the, the size of the, the cell. Like, sometimes the cell is like, how depends on how you plan it. Uh, optically, op, 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 optim, optimally, optimally, yeah, optimally, it will take like maybe if you can keep it, keep, uh, it, it, it has to come up, it has to come with uh, minus and everything so that it gives a low low and then uh, you will have this uh, liner on top also uh, after you, you nice. liner it's like okay. uh, like the plastics. Uh, uh, layer that you have to close it down, and then uh, of, on, on top you may want to lay just like a liner or some just plants like the, the grass vegetation, just vegetation, and you wait for like maybe 10 to 20 years. Uh, 15 years, in within 15 years, it will generate maximum capacity of uh, methane gas which you can harvest. While it will, well, most of this methane gas will slowly. That is like to contain it, and then you you, you extract methane gas from our power generation for different purposes, and uh, you have to do it. That 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 thing is having to do it in sanitary So you plan to excavate a, a big hole, and then you put in liners, then you put in the gas where the, the gas uh, pipes, and then the, also the leaching pipes, and then you start keeping all. In. So normally it will take like maybe uh, you will excavate maybe nine meters into the ground, and then on top maybe you will go another nine meters, something like that. So that's fifteen years, you said. Yeah, you you have to finish the whole thing, then you keep it there for fifteen years. Then you, it will have a, a, a bigger consumption, a, a bigger generation, a, a bigger bigger volume. Of Okay, so actually the, the whole point, yeah, you have to ask something. So, uh, the harvested methane, is it trying to be uh, harvested from the landfill? I'm not sure about Malaysia. So far, we never, the company that I was working with, we are burning it off because we want to, uh, we were selling carbon credits uh, under the CGM, clean people, clean people, clean people, clean people, clean people, and that is, in terms of we are not generating our so we just put it off. 
Okay, so this this is a plant in Kapong. This is actually the leachate discharge from a, a waste transfer station. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks like that. It's black in color. And, uh, this is untreated leachate. Uh, in sanitary landfill, you actually treat the leachate. Uh, when it, and when it's, after it's treated, it comes out as clear water. Yeah. So I would advise you to uh, go and visit a landfill, sanitary landfill. There's one in Bukit Taga, uh, run by KUB Berjaya. It's quite well run. I visited there uh, before. Uh, and there are, there's another one near the KLIA2 called Tanjung Do Blast. Uh, you'll be able to see some of these processes there. So it's actually important for you all to know. Uh, uh, the one in Bukit Daga, the sanitary landfill, uh, they, they have liners uh, below to trap the leachate from going into the groundwater. And then once a cell is completed, uh, is filled up, what they do is that they cover the cell and then they would extract the methane gas uh, and then they would burn it and sell it back to the grid. Right? So, uh, have you all heard of something called the feed-in tariff? Anyone here knows what a feed-in tariff is? Yeah, okay. What is that? Jasmine? Uh, I roughly know what it is, but I don't really know how to explain it. Um, you turn all the energy to um, what is electricity. Okay, so... We get paid for it, yeah. Yes. Does this apply to the solar panels that yes. the green have to work with? So you can actually earn money from it, uh, which is useful because, uh, you know, not only are you doing something that's environmentally friendly, because you burn up the CH4, the methane gas, before it goes into the environment. But you also can generate electricity that you can put it back into the grid. Uh, it's, it's clean. Uh, and uh, you get money for it as well. You're rewarded for it financially. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about renewable energy later, uh, just to give you all a little bit more knowledge on it. Yeah, so, um, uh, that is the direct way in which your rubbish can contribute to uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, and I think it's important to have that discussion because whatever policies that you all think about, right, or whatever policies that has been proposed by the Malaysian government, the devil is always in the detail. And you would get much more out of your trip to COP22 if you have a more detailed understanding of some of these interlinkages and also policies, policy proposals behind uh, some of these uh, uh, environmental issues because they all are part of the larger ecosystem. So indirect way in which, uh, let's say, uncontrolled increase of rubbish can contribute to emissions of greenhouse gases. What's the indirect way? The direct way just now I said, right? You have you know, decomposition and then anaerobic uh, digestion and then uh, emissions of CH4. What is the indirect way? Can you all guess? What does lack of recycling, how does la the lack of recycling or low recycling rate add to your contribution to the carbon footprint? Uh, you're using more resources to create waste? Yes. Right. You, if you throw more stuff, it means that you have to use more resources to uh, create and sell more stuff. Right. As opposed to if you recycle, you can reuse the stuff uh, and uh, use less resources to get build more stuff, or to get to get make more stuff like. So, for example, if you want to, uh, um, <coughs> your your uh, mineral water bottles, plastic, right? So there are two ways in which using those things can damage the environment. One is you drink and then you throw it. It's very wasteful, right? So that stuff will contribute to your landfill. The second way is the second way is what do you need what do you need to uh, make that what is used when you make that mineral water uh, mineral water bottle fossil, fossil fuel. Yes. so you use fossil fuels to make the plastic right uh, and you also use electricity to make that plastic right so all this requires fossil fuels or some sort of carbon uh, based material right so that is the indirect way so remember, so when you talk about waste, there's the direct way, emissions, and then also uh, the indirect way in terms of the resources that you use. Right? So when you want to talk about uh, eliminating or reducing waste as a means of reducing your greenhouse gas emissions, right, you need to think of, of it in terms of both the direct and the indirect. Right? Okay. 
So waste, uh, factories, uh, I think you guys missed out one big one. We're talking about, uh, so, sorry, you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, just tell us your name, uh, what you're doing now, studying or working, uh, and then what do you hope to achieve when you go to uh, Marrakesh? Where you study? Your, you did like a American a ADP, C, C, your Canadian program? Or? It's uh, an Australian matriculation program. Okay, okay. Yeah. I think I hope to raise awareness like about COVID. On what? On convincing um, people that this is an issue so I can. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think younger people is easier la, because I think you guys are a little bit more interested uh, in environmental issues. But yeah, la, it's not it's not easy to get people excited about environmental issues. Let me show you. I can show you. Yeah, so this is the Bukit Taga landfill. You can see this is the lining. Uh, it's in Hulu Slango. Uh, and, uh, yeah. There are different layers for the waste. And then uh, this was the carbon credits that uh, Kevin was talking about. Uh, these are the... Uh, you have a small solar plant there. And then... Uh, This is where they burn, burn the methane gas. So it's uh, one of the, I would say probably the best, the best landfill, sanitary landfill in, in Malaysia. Uh, in Johor, how many sanitary landfills are there when you were at SWM? Uh, I think there's one now. Uh, there's another one. Uh, so, and uh, there are probably, how many unsanitary landfills there? 20 over, probably? Johor, around 12. Some have been closed because uh, it's yes. filled up already, like, and it's, it's basically an environmental hazard. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I mentioned just now there's one area in which you all haven't talked about. Uh, emissions of greenhouse gases contributor. So you talk about factories. Huh? What is that? <laughs> this is your, what you're trying to reduce, right? Yeah. Vehicles. So, uh, cars, buses. Uh, I advise you all to go to uh, uh, when you have time go to the White House actually what do we do now? <laughs> go to the White House website okay go to climate issues and then climate change right so this this is some of the stuff that Obama is very keen on and he spent quite a lot of uh, political capital on this, the Clean Power Plan uh, you know, Act to basically reduce uh, carbon pollution through a reduction in uh, uh, carbon powered plants. Okay, this is a uh, passenger vehicle standards, okay. pledges by businesses, methane emissions. Okay, this one is not so... Uh, not so relevant in Malaysia, like, uh, but uh, other than other than uh, uh, landfills, can you think of other major major sort of like uh, sources of methane pollution in the world? How how so? Which part of agriculture? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, which is the which is what the but are you thinking of a specific livestock? That cows. Works? Yes. <laughs> so actually, yeah, cows. You know, they have a lot of uh, they are yes. big animals. Mm. They they generate a lot of waste, uh, and that waste emits a lot of uh, methane. So what they they are actually doing in uh, the U.S. and other places where they have really love cows is uh, they will collect the dung and then put it in a place where 
like something like a sentry landfill and then they would uh, burn off the methane gas and then try to sell it back to the grid where possible. Uh, in Malaysia, I visited uh, a plant uh, which does the same thing for uh, chicken dung. So there's a company called uh, uh, it starts with Q, uh, Q something. They are the largest uh, chicken egg sellers in Malaysia. They have a plant in Pajang, uh, near in Negeri Sembilan, and uh, they have, were paying, uh, they were paying, uh, basically farmers to get take away the chicken shit for fertilizer, uh, but because there was too much, the farmers couldn't uh, didn't know how to handle it. So the one of their, uh, the children of one of the founders was actually quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, forward thinking, and the person actually commissioned a biogas plant uh, next to the chicken, uh, chicken farm, uh, and they used the power generated to power the chicken farm, so they don't have to pay any electricity. Ah, oh, sorry, QL, QL resources. Oh, okay, so I Google my own article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, let me put. QL resources. So you can see here, first company in Malaysia to actually build a biogas plant. Yeah, their biogas plant looks something like this. Actually, I think this is the one. So that's where they keep all the manure. It would generate the gas, and then uh, they will burn up the gas, and then uh, they would uh, channel the, the remaining waste uh, you know, into another place and sell it off as fertilizer. Right? So this is another way in which you can actually think of waste uh, not just as, a, as something that, is, that needs to be uh, you know, treated as a cost, but it can actually be treated as, as a possible resource. Hence the term waste to energy. Uh, waste to energy basically means you burn up rubbish turn it into energy. Uh, that's what incinerators does. Yeah. I mean, I, I have my concerns about incinerators as well, but that's, that's uh, for another debate. Okay, so for, trans uh, we talked about transportation just now, right? Okay. Um, what, how, how would you, uh, what are some of the policies that you can introduce to, uh, you know, reduce greenhouse gases uh, in terms of transportation? What would you do? So that's what the Malaysian government has argued, and then I think it's it's in the INDCs as well. So the Malaysian government will say, okay, what are the X, Y, and Z that we have done from public transportation, like for example, what? Uh, MRT. Okay, MRT line one and line two. Okay, yeah, extended LRT. Okay, extended mm -hmm. LRT, building LRT line three. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, okay, so how would you evaluate the relative success? or maybe some of the shortcomings associated with public transport initiatives such as what the government has come up with. How, how effective is it from a, from a reduction in greenhouse gases standpoint? How would you measure it? Ah, okay, yes. So you will measure it in a couple of ways. Uh. If you can reduce the number of cars on the road, then you would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? Uh, <coughs> and then
the same time, if you can show that you've increased uh, ridership in public transportation, then you can use that as a basis to argue that, look, these are successful mitigation measures that have taken. But uh, uh, you, to, to really carefully evaluate the effectiveness of these plans, you also need to look at uh, other ways of measuring. So for example, if I still need to drive to the LRT station or the MRT station, then it becomes less effective because there's uh, the network of uh, feeder buses are not good enough, right? which is what I think they are experiencing on the LRT uh, line now. That's one. Uh, the other thing is, uh, the government has actually a policy called the National Automotive Policy to promote EEVs. Do you know what EEVs are? What's that? Uh, it's a broader category. Uh, they call it uh, energy efficient vehicles, of which uh, electric vehicles is obviously the most energy efficient. Right? Uh, so that, that, that's, I mean, you can get and Google this, it's very easy to find. Uh, newer cars are generally more energy efficient than older cars because they have better technology. Right? Uh, and then, if let's say you look at hybrid cars, those would be even more energy efficient compared to regular new cars. So, if you look at the national automotive policy, the newest one, uh, it would have some of these, uh, some of these uh, measures there as well. Okay, uh, I think Natasha talked about power plants just now. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, coal plant, coal fired plants as one of the major sources of uh, of uh, pollution, and uh, this is something which uh, I think Obama has talked about as well uh, through his uh, clean power plant. Okay, who who. So if let's say, uh, you know, power plants are, uh, or certain, certain sorts of power plants are a, a major source of uh, pollution uh, in this country. Um, the question that I want to ask is who determines what kind of power plants are built in this country? Do you know? Ministry of what? <laughs> Who? Do you know? Kelvin? Uh, Kip Suhan Jayatanaga. Kip Suhan Jayatanaga. What's Suhan Okay, so this is the ST, this is the Energy Commission of Malaysia. They are the ones who actually determine policy on uh, power generation, right? Um, I think Zun Yang just now talked about some of the, the sort of like uh, larger economic uh, issues that are important in this country. From the ST standpoint, uh, their main priority is to make sure that the country has a stable uh, source of energy, stable, dependable source of energy. Their concerns are not primarily to do with uh, the sustainability of this energy. Right? Because you know, their mandate is to make sure that there's enough energy to keep the economy growing at whatever rate that we're growing at. Right? Uh, so, uh, <coughs> one of the things, one of the data sources that you should go and take a look at is to look at their publications. So they have different statistics uh, and uh, publications here. Uh, which is the one that I want to look at. Okay. So this is... Uh, Electricity Supply Industry Outlook. They publish it every year. They also have a lot of other useful statistics. And they will actually give you a breakdown of the kind of uh, uh, power generation capacity that's needed in the country moving forward, you know, how many gigawatts that we need, and then also the breakdown of this, uh, of this, uh, you know, this, uh, this supply of energy. So, <coughs> um, let me ask you guys, which, is, which, is the, which do you think is the cleanest 
way of generating electricity. Cleanest in terms of uh, GHG emissions. Solar, okay, that's one. Wind. Hmm? Wind. Any others? Huh? <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, uh, okay, um, hydro, uh, we don't have enough, yes, <coughs> and, yeah, hydro we do, la, but it's very far away, yes, <laughs> okay, uh, so the cleaner ways would be solar, wind, hydro, ways, um, okay, I'll put that in as well, uh, and then there's one more, we don't currently we don't have in Malaysia, but it's in the works. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm not talking about cost, huh? uh, You know, cost is another separate matter. Right. Um, uh, okay. Let's say take away nuclear because we don't have it right now. Although there are plans to, to propose it, we can talk about that later. Uh, out of the others, lah. Okay. Uh, I should put in another one also. Uh, this is a form of energy generation that is very uh, popular in two countries, Iceland and New Zealand. Geothermal. Okay. Malaysia, we only have one place that's capable of producing geothermal energy and it's a place near Tawau and Sabah. Uh, okay, so let's say take away geothermal, we don't have any, any, uh, you know, uh, any sources that are generating electricity now. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you, you put in, let's say, hydro, uh, solar, wind, uh, um, burning stuff. Uh, not necessarily only, only, um, uh, only waste. La. There, are other, there are other things that you can burn. Not, not just solid waste. Uh. There are other things that you can burn as well. Biomass, uh, you know, your, your, uh, the, the old palm mill, uh, palm oil feedstock, the, you know, the stuff that you cannot use anymore. You, you, you can take it and burn it. Uh, what do you think is Malaysia's target in terms of renew renewable energy generation? Uh, you know, uh, let's say total generation capacity is 100%. What do you think uh, Malaysia's target for the renewable energy generation is? Let's say to 2025. Do you all know? 40%. 40%. If we really have some good, good efficiency solar panels, uh, that would be like it would have to be like a mass scale, like it's not a small enterprise, and then we can maybe achieve fifty, sixty percent. But I'm not sure whether in the next thirty years, for example, Suhanjaya or Kanata has signed like a thirty years contract with some coal provider from China. Then how can they make use of the coal? It's a good question. And this is a question that I asked in Parliament. Okay. Minta Menteri Tenaga Tenaga Hijau dan Air untuk menyatakan unjuran permintaan elektrik dan rancangan pembakaran sumber Dana Kuasa Elektrik untuk Penanjung Malaysia, Sabah dan Sarawak from 2050 until 2030. Okay, so this is the answer. This, this is from the ministry. Yeah. I didn't make it up. Arang Batu, which is the most polluting one. Uh, it is expected to go up to 65% by 2025 and then uh, reduce slightly to 50%. Uh, gas, which is uh, less polluting compared to... Uh, compared to uh, coal, but still more polluting compared to other renew renewables, right? Uh, expected to go up to 32% and then 54%. Hydro, uh, you know, it's about 4 to 5%. This for Peninsula Malaysia. Penanga Bodhi Baru, your renewable energy. Uh, solar, wind, uh, waste to energy, 3%. Right. And then here, alternative, I think this is nuclear, like 10, 20, 19%. I'm not sure whether it can be. 
So what you said just now was Malaysia wanted to reach 40%, right? Look at the numbers here. Why, why is this the case? Why, why do you think that there's this discrepancy? Why? why? Why is Malaysia so dependent on coal and gas? <sighs> why is it expensive? Because coal is cheap. Coal is very cheap. Right? Mm. Yeah. And it's still the cheapest way of generating electricity. Uh, especially now, uh, you, know, uh, the, uh, you know, the availability of cheap coal from places like India and, uh, and Indonesia it allows, allows companies to generate electricity at a very uh, you know, lucrative rate. Um, and there's another there's another reason which is this is from uh, Keta, the ministry in charge of uh, you know, energy and they will get their figures from Suranjaya Tanaka Energy Commission so remember what I said what is the motivating factor what, what is the motivation of uh, or the main priority of ST What is the problem with renewable in terms of uh, in terms of uh, electricity generation? It's not reliable. What's that? It's not, it's not nearly as efficient, you know? Yes, that's that's one. Okay, so when you're talking about efficiency, what exactly are you talking about? Well, I'm referring in particular to solar panels. Uh, it's not as efficient. So efficient uh, in that sense is basically conversion. Yeah. Right? Conversion from one energy source to another. So for, for coal is conversion from your fossil fuels to, to electricity. For solar is conversion of sunlight into electricity. For wind is conversion of wind into electricity. Right? So maybe the best solar technology now can convert like 30%. Right? Uh, so that, that, that of course increases the cost generation per kilowatt. Right? Uh, that's one. Uh, what are some of the other challenges associated with renewable energy that the, the Suranjaya Tanaga would take into account? Let's say for solar, what are some of the challenges? Can you, can you generate solar uh, at night? <laughs> right? So the stability of the energy production is something that they have also have to take into consideration. Right? Uh, how, how easy is it to generate, let's say, 2,000 megawatts of power uh, versus, uh, in a, using a coal-fired plant versus solar panels? I, I don't expect you all to know this, but the land size that you need for solar panels is much larger compared to, let's say, the place you need for, for uh, you know, coal-fired plants. And if, let's say, you don't have solar farms, you depend on the consumer, you're dependent on, you know, hundreds of thousands of consumers fixing the solar panels on their ceiling, which is something uh, on, on their roofs, which is something we will come to later. So in terms of being able to project energy demand, you know, if, let's say, I'm the energy commission, given a choice between building, uh, between having 100,000 households install, uh, you know, uh, solar panels in their houses versus building one solar, one uh, coal-fired plant, which one is the one that's easier to do? Obvious, right? So from their perspective, you, you have to understand their motivations. Right? Of course, this will have an impact on, on our INDC. We say, 40, I mean, you know, we say we want to reach re renewable 40%. But look at this. Right? So how, how, there's a perjanggahan here. Lah. Okay. Why is burning of coal in a country like Malaysia or other developing countries much more affordable or cheaper compared to burning coal in, in uh, developed countries. You know, can you all guess why? This has something to do with economics. What are, what are externalities? Um, the bad effects. You mentioned like the bad effects when you do something. 
Okay, it got to be more specific. The oh. bad effects that are not what? Not priced. Yeah, not taken into account. Yes, not taken into account. Right? So, uh, the, uh, when, when you burn coal, that is the uh, actual price, which is how much you buy the coal. Right? And when you burn the coal, you don't take into account how much you pollute the environment. The pollution aspect is not priced into the cost of coal in developing countries. Whereas in developed countries, uh, a lot of the time, let's say through things like carbon credits, you actually have to pay for the cost of pollution. Right? This is something that they've tried to implement in Europe. Uh, they have a carbon trading scheme. It has not really been that successful for different reasons. Uh, but yeah, this is something that you all sort of like need to keep at the back of your mind. That, uh, you know, one of the reasons why developing countries continue to use Burn coal is that the, pro the, the, the actual cost, including the environmental cost, is not priced into, into the cost of burning the coal. Okay, now I want to introduce you to another organization which is sort of like the, the uh, a little bit of a counter to, uh, to the securities, uh, to, this, uh, to the Energy Commission. How many of you have heard of this organization called SEDA, SEDA? Okay. So what, what does it do? Do you know? But do you know what it does? Kevin? Do you know what they do? Uh, they, uh, they actually regulate uh, the renewable energy project which I guess they in Malaysia. Say that. Uh, it was established in 2011 under the Sustainable Energy Development Authority Act. So it's a statutory body created by an Act of Parliament. And it has oversight on, supposed to have oversight on all renewable energy policy in Malaysia. Right? So I am in close touch with, uh, with the people that have uh, clashed with them before on, on different things. Let me just show you. How, how things may not be, uh, uh, how things are a little bit screwed up in Malaysia. Uh, let me just show you. This is a uh, SEDA briefings. Huh? I'll just show you one random one. This was done in, I think, 2010. There should be a graph here. Okay, this is SIDA's viewpoint. Renewable energy, business as usual, it will be this kind of growth. This is what is SIDA's action plan. Right, so 2015 is supposed to reach 6%, 2020 11%, 2030 17%. And maybe by 2050 is very ambitious last time. But even looking at 2030, it is 17%. Whereas if you look at the ministry reply, it is what? 3%. SEDA doesn't include hydro. Hydro is not included under renewable energy in SEDA. So you can see already, you have energy commission. Their priority is to make sure that we can generate a stable uh, source of energy. The sustainability part also important. Not that big of a priority. Sedan is very important because they are supposed to be in charge of renewable energy. 
So this is one area in which you have two agencies that actually have conflicting viewpoints and conflicting priorities. And it's something that not, is not unique to Malaysia. Other places have it too. Right? So um, I think I should go a little bit more into SEDA because it's an agency that I'm quite familiar with, uh, which I think probably you guys may not be so familiar with. Uh, and it also affects renewable energy policy in Malaysia, which I think all of you have to know before you go to COP22. Okay? So, yeah. It's okay, you can interrupt any time. Yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, in between SEDA and the Energy Commission, who gets the final say? Uh, the final say would be in the hands of the Minister. Uh, the Minister of Energy, Green Technology and Water. Uh, and both of these agencies are under him. So you have, the Minister has to play a balancing act. Uh, and uh, if let's say the Minister maybe not so keen on renewable energy, then you can see which side will get the priority. And if let's say, some of the awarding of some of these big power plant contracts, which are very lucrative, uh, goes above the head of, uh, of the minister, then he, even he may be powerless to, to try to you know, influence the process. So, uh, for example, If I were to Google track 4B, okay, it says power plant. Okay. If I go down to this entry, okay. <coughs> you can see uh, one of the, uh, there are different tracks in terms of planning for power plants. One of the track was track 4B, uh, and it was a, it's a gas power plant, 2000 megawatts, uh, and it was uh, actually awarded to. 1MDB, uh, sorry, uh, this one, track 3B, sorry. It was actually awarded to 1MDB. This was before 1MDB sold off its power assets. And, uh, yeah, and, and this goes above the head of the, the minister in charge of energy because uh, when it involves 1MDB, it involves the prime minister. <laughs> so this is one, one example of where other larger political concerns overrides uh, our, our environmental commitments. Right. So you can see SEDA, ST, the minister, and I thought the minister is the prime minister. So it depends on how all these different priorities are balanced and who has more power to determine how these, uh, how these uh, contracts are allocated. Right. So, so I, I, did, I don't really want to go into too much of the politi politics part lah, because that one we need to be aware, but I think maybe, uh, you know, less so of your priority in terms of going to COP22. But you should be something that you should at least uh, keep at the back of your mind. Okay, let's go back to SEDA. Uh, okay. Uh, one of the main responsibilities for SEDA is to govern or inf uh, make policy with regards to the feeding tariff. Just now I brought it up already. Uh, how many of you here live in houses or apartments with aircon? Assume all right. <laughs> you don't have aircon in your house. Okay. Uh, do you mind me asking? You you stay with your parents or you stay no. alone, or you rent a? You I rent a, a unit. Okay. So what is your uh, electricity bill? Electricity bill monthly electricity bill. 30, 30 ringgit. Okay. This for the whole house. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for all the others with aircon you actually pay money to the feed-in tariff. Uh, any any aircon bill, sorry, any electricity bill that's more than 80 ringgit, uh, 1.7 uh, 1. or 8%, I can't remember which, 1.8% uh, of your bill is contributed to the feed-in tariff fund or the... Uh, Dana Tenaga Bode Baru. So this is what I want you all to do. Go back home after this. Ask your parents for the electricity bill. And then look for the line that says uh, Sumbangan Kepada Dana TBB. Depending on how much uh, aircon you use, actually aircon is the one that uses up the most electricity. Uh, the contribution, monthly contribution is anywhere between 3 to 8 ringgit. If you reach 10 ringgit, it means you use a lot of aircon already. Uh, so, 
Uh, this fund is collected from uh, energy users it, it, uh, and it is used to pay for the feed-in tariff. What is the feed-in tariff? The feed-in tariff is uh, a license that you can apply for uh, to generate renewable energy on your own, either through solar, biomass, biogas, which gives you the right to sell the energy back into the grid and, uh, and uh, you know, get money from the feed-in tariff for your renewable energy generation. Okay, so how is this um, how is this fund useful in terms of uh, climate change mitigation or, 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 or uh, decreasing generation of greenhouse gases? How is it useful? Yeah, so you're displacing some coal power plant uh, you know, required energy generation. Uh, why do you need why do you need this feed-in tariff fund? Why is it needed? Right, because buying solar plants and installing them is not cheap. Any of you have solar plants in your houses? I assume very few people have it. You have, huh? Oh, for water heater. Okay, so this has been there for quite some time already. Uh. More than 10 years, okay. So, usually for, for installations that are more than 10 years, uh, you don't have, uh, you, your parents probably didn't apply to the feed-in tariff. Do you know why they got the, got, the, uh, got the solar plants? Is it purely economic or were they also, they, they, were they also environmentally aware? Uh, but the payback period is actually quite long. So if you have the feed-in tariff, you can actually pay for the cost of your uh, of buying that unit within probably uh, eight to ten years. And uh, after that, you will generate money that can be you know counted as uh, as savings for you or uh, counted as profit for you. The the contract with uh, Seda is twenty one years uh, for for solar for solar plants. Okay, so. Uh, can you all uh, give me a ballpark figure? How much do you think Seda collects from consumers such as yourself every year through the feed-in tariff? Give me a ballpark figure. Like 10 million, 100 million. No? 30, 30 million? 30 million. One billion. Okay. Any other guesses? Is uh, I think the latest annual report, two thousand and fifteen annual report, their yearly collection then was about uh, between seven hundred to eight hundred million ringgit. Right. So it's not a small amount. Right. It's almost a billion ringgit that they collect from the consumer, uh, and they need that to pay out, uh, you know, all those people who have. Uh, uh, this particular quota. What do they do with the service funds? They have to pay the people who install the solar panels. No, I mean, so you <coughs> have a fixed percentage, right? About 1.7 to 1.8 charged to everyone who's not using it. Yes. So then, uh, if I think this is the case, I don't think there's enough people that's using solar panels uh, and selling to the grid to amount to 700 to 800. What would they do with the surplus amount? Actually, actually, the way they've calculated it is that there is the, they don't have a surplus. Or rather, whatever, um, whatever surplus that they've kept, uh, that they are keeping, is used to pay for, is, is, will be used to pay for uh, future, uh, future oblig financial obligations that they have. So, for example, right now, you have... Uh, 
uh, certain amount of uh, quotas that have been given out, you don't start, they, they won't start generating electricity straight away. You only start generating electricity when it's installed, maybe one or two years later. And then you have uh, more and more solar plants coming online. Right? So as more of them come online, the, 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 the cost for you also escalates along the way. Right? So they've done some calculations, internal calculations. They have someone in charge of uh, this uh, within SEDA, such that whatever they collect uh, is uh, sufficient to pay out that quotas over the cost of, remember it's 21 years and and then they are supposed to stop collecting the FIT tariff uh, at the end of maybe 2020 or 2021. It's, good, it's, it's within the next couple of years. Uh. So they stop collecting it, but do they still pay? Whatever obligations that they have, they have to pay. So they, it is within their uh, planning framework that they would stop collecting the FIT after a certain amount of time. Uh, and the reason why they stop collecting is within, within this larger renewable energy sector, they expect the cost of electricity to be increasing uh, such that you can achieve something, what, something that they call grid parity. Uh, when the cost of electricity increases, uh, that means to the consumer, uh, and at the same time, the cost of generating electricity from solar cells decrease because technology is improving, you'll, come at a, you'll, you'll reach a time where there's grid parity and it will be uh, economical for you to install the, power, the, the solar uh, panels without needing the FIT. Whether or not we'll come to that, again, it's, it depends on political decisions that have to be made in terms of pricing our electricity. Right now, our electricity prices is still relatively low uh, you know, in, in, uh, when we compare it to uh, the region and also other countries. So this is something that's, that's quite complicated, but it's very important because whenever you talk about renewable energy, you have to refer to SEDA. So let's say that, that this this funds actually contribute to the feed-in tariff, and that's how they connect the why they have the quota like per year when they achieve this kind of quota they don't take any more they, they don't take in any more uh, input uh, 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 applications yeah applications yes. well so in this case it is not like uh, the Tanaga National is paying for the for the applications. So it is using this one. Yes. Yeah, so there's something that's very important for you to know. Uh, that basically the cost of these solar panels, uh, at least the contract, uh, is being paid for by consumers. But it's quite a progressive policy because if your electricity bill is below 80 ringgit, uh, they, they, have a, they express it in terms of uh, how many megawatts you consume. Like. Uh, and most of the low-income families in Malaysia, they don't use aircon. Right? So their, their electricity bill is like 50, 60 ringgit. They don't pay into that fund. So people who use aircon, those who are you know, middle class, they can afford it, they pay into that fund. Right? And uh, yeah, um, But this fund is limited. Uh, that's why there's a huge demand uh, for the quota uh, to install, to be able to install your solar panels and then to be able to sell it back to the grid. Huge demand. Uh, they have applications in the thousands every year. Uh, the number of people who get it are probably uh, you know, 10%, uh, 10 20% who get it. Uh, in the past, uh, SEDA has been one of the more transparent organizations in Malaysia to give them credit. In the past, they used to give out these quotas based on a first come, first serve basis. You log on into the internet, and then once they open the window for you to uh, put in your application, a lot of people will just put in their application and then the computer will just queue you up and then the first X number, uh, they would just they would take those applications and then uh, the rest they will put on a waiting list or they will reject it. Right? So what happened in the past was that some people are very smart. Uh, they actually place their computers or servers as close as possible physically to the SEDA servers in Putrajaya. So I know people who actually like ran out a room or ran out an office in Putrajaya. So that they can, you know, once the window opens, they just submit and then all the applications will get processed. Uh, and this was uh, uh, an area of uh, concern because uh, some of the industry players weren't happy that people were gaming the system. So SEDA, uh, at that time Tony, Tony Po and uh, Nuru Iza uh, complained about this. I helped them do some research. At that time I wasn't happy yet. 
uh, and after after complaints were made by the industry as well as some MPs, SEDA changed their process. They actually do an open ballot. Uh, so whoever is applying, you know, they will put that in, all the applications in, and then they will se segregate it by uh, the number of uh, kilowatts. So the, there will be uh, you know, applications between like uh, you know, 4, to, 4 to 72 kilowatts, and then from 72 kilowatts to 1 megawatt. They will split it up, put all the applications into like ping pong balls, give the number, and then they would have a session where all the uh, people who apply are invited to that room, and then they will get the minister, deputy minister, the SEDA chairman to come and pick up the box. And they've invited me to some of their sessions also. I've gone, uh, not this year, I've gone in the last two years, 2015 and 2014. Yeah, and they don't kick me out, they let me observe the process. Right. So that from that perspective, the industry players are more happy. Uh, but the latest development is the uh, Ministry uh, Keta uh, is now wanting to award what they call solar farms. Uh, solar farms are uh, utility scale farms which is very big. Right now under this feed-in tariff, uh, the maximum that you can apply for is one megawatt. Uh, under the utility scale uh, contracts, it will be over 100 megawatts, right? And it's not being paid for by the feed-in tariff. For the over 100 megawatts uh, solar farms, uh, the companies themselves have to uh, have to negotiate directly with Tanaga in terms of the tariff charge. Right? Uh, so, uh, having solar farms, I think, is uh, both good and bad. The good part is. All these, your solar panels, right, is uh, the capacity is too limited uh, to be able to reach your target of, you know, 15%, 20%, 40% of renewable. So to scale up, you actually need those solar plants, 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt. So, uh, you know, for, so from that perspective, it's actually good to have solar farms. But the negative side uh, in the Malaysian context is that these solar farms, the contracts are not, uh, not awarded based on open tender, which means that you can go to the minister and then directly negotiate with the minister. So, again, if let's say I Google, <laughs> so again, you see this company coming into question. So one of my press statements came up. So. Okay. So when a DP form a you know, joint venture to produce a 15 megawatt solar farm, this is in 2014, uh, I believe that they were awarded uh, a contract to build up to 500 megawatts, but they were only able to start with 50 megawatts. This is in 2014. Eh? May 2014. This more than two years later, the the plant hasn't even started constructed uh, started being constructed yet. Okay, this is uh, one MDB. And then uh, January 2016, 150 megawatt utility scale solar plant have, have been awarded to a consortium. I asked the minister in parliament, "Can you name me the consortium?" He refused to. So this is one of the things that uh, that is problematic like, in the Malaysian context. This one, you know, in, in the in terms of discussing renewable energy and sustainability and also uh, COP22, what is important to you guys is uh, you know, how much renewable energy we are currently generating and how much renewable energy uh, we will generate in the future. But as Malaysians who are interested in uh, you know, public policy, the transparency aspect is also important. Because ultimately, if let's say you are going to award these plants by direct negotiation, the pricing may not be the best price. And at the end of the day, if let's say the pricing to these companies is higher than what you may have gotten through an open tender, ultimately who will, who will, be the, who will suffer from it? Consumers. Yes, or rather, more specifically, consumers. Because you, are, you have to pay the electricity bill. If they increase the electricity bill, uh, you know, because of 
uh, pressures to, to deliver on some of these contracts, then the, the, the consumer will have to you know, bear the cost of it. I recommend you guys to go and go to the CEDAR site because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, so for example, you can see the different areas of uh, renewable energy. Solar PV, community. This is actually quite interesting. Uh, I think it's a good move on the part of CEDAR. If let's say you're a school uh, or a religious institution, you can actually apply for a quota to put a solar panel on top of your roof. Uh, you know, let's say you're a church or a temple or a mosque, and this is a good way for your organization to generate income. Uh, this quota is usually under undertaken. Um, sorry, not, not undertaken. It's, uh, un, uh, there's usually spare capacity. Not enough people are applying for it. This is individual in your own on your own roofs. Not individual uh, for like factory owners. They have more. You know, they have uh, bigger land sizes. Uh, you know, and then these are the ones that are done by companies who are specializing in solar panels and solar farms. Okay, biogas uh, and also biogas landfill agricultural waste. So this is the one that we talked about just now, uh, you know, burning the methane and all that. Biomass, uh, things like the palm oil, uh, you know, uh, mill stock, and then solid waste, which is your waste to energy, burning your rubbish, right? And then a uh, small hydro. More hydro is like you know small rivers, not the Bakun Dam, uh, small rivers uh, that can can apply for this uh, FIP. Right? And then you can see the quota. They actually tell you uh, the quota that are open. So for example, community there's usually some spare capacity. This is the one that they they have been installed. This is the one that you know this this, this the applications. Usually the applications. There's not much of quota left. How does the application work? Okay. Um, you, have, you have to download you have to download a host of a whole host of forms uh, from the uh, from the from SEDA's website and then uh, you have to submit those applications to SEDA as and when the window opens for those applications. What usually happens is that the solar company who's installing your system for you, they will do all the paperwork for you. You just have to sign the documents, that's all. And then, for the bigger installations, you actually have to go through more uh, stringent technical requirements. Like. So, something, some, for, for anything that's over 500 kilowatt, you have to do something called a power system study to make sure that your, the, the, the system that you're proposing is actually feasible. Okay, and then, uh, you can see biomass, biogas, small hydro. So all these details are actually accessible on their website. You can download the annual reports as well to get to get uh, look at look at some of the details. 2014, 13, 12, 11. Okay. Successful exploratory drilling marks the country's first geothermal potential in Sapa. You can get Google my name and geothermal energy. Like I've written a press statement about this, being a little bit critical. Okay, so for FIT, it applies in Peninsular Malaysia and it applies in Sabah. It does not apply in Sarawak because uh, Sarawak, they have their own uh, energy policy. Uh, the, the, the largest energy, I mean the, the energy utility there is not Tanaga, it's something called the Sarawak uh, Electric uh, Development Corporation. Uh, and you know, they have their own power generating entity in the state of Sarawak. Can you guess why Sarawak may not uh, is not too keen on renewable energy? Any guesses? Huh? But then again, like the dam does not reach towards the rural areas in Sarawak in terms of energy supply because um, I've done a couple of micro hydro projects in um, the rural villages of Sarawak and Which part? Um, Kampung Sapi. That's uh, in around the Cebu, uh, outside Cebu. No, uh, um, border of Kalimantan. Okay, okay. That means you go to Kuching lah. You yeah, go from Kuching. Kuching. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, it's under uh, engineers without borders. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's that? 
Latifah. Yeah, Latifah, Sanjay, Mahmoud. Yeah. So even though they have their own dance, the electricity and the start accessible shop for girls now, because some of them is quite rural and it's displaced by the rain. Okay. So actually, it's two separate issues. One is the electricity generation part. Mm -hmm. The part that you're talking about is electricity distribution. Yeah. Right. So actually, uh, Bakun Dam, uh, do you know where it's located, Bakun Dam? Is it in the urban area or the rural area? Okay, this is Bakun ah. This is Bintulu. It is really in the middle of nowhere. Right. So this is the generation, electricity generation part. Right. And then they pull the power line to the main grid uh, along the coast to supply electricity in Bintulu, all the way up to Miri. I mean, the, the, the main grid is along the coastline. Uh, right. So there are actually many places in the rural areas where you can actually see the, the electricity lines from the main dam Going, uh, going to the main grid, but it doesn't get connected to the kampung, which is let's say, you know, ten meters from the from the from the grid. That's a distribution issue. Uh, you know, it's costly to the government in Sarawak argue that it's costly to connect all the all the rural villages, uh, But uh, you know, actually, the Sarawak government can afford it. It's just, it's just I think. Uh, a political decision of not wanting to spend that kind of money to, to connect the, the rural kampongs. But going back to renewable energy, the reason why Sarawak is not keen on renewable energy, right, the things that I talked about just now that is highlighted in Seda is Bakun's uh, gener electricity generation potential is something like 2.4 gigawatts uh, at full capacity. The energy consumption for the entire Sarawak is something like uh, 800 megawatts. So Bakun can generate f three times what Sarawak needs in terms of energy. Uh, they have out of six turbines, if I'm not mistaken, only two are working. Only two are inactive in operation because they don't need the other six, the other four. That's enough already. So given the fact that uh, you know, uh, Sarawak is so dependent on uh, is, has so much excess hydro capacity, it doesn't need uh, renewable. Right? Okay. So this is also something that is that is quite tricky, la, which you also have to be aware of. Because if you look at the large, the big ticket numbers, right? Sarawak energy uh, in terms of uh, power generation, right? Uh, is by far the highest in the whole of Malaysia in terms of hydroelectricity. Because this is coming from the dam. So from a, let's say if you include hydro as a renewable source, uh, in the sense that it doesn't, you know, generate much greenhouse gases compared to coal-fired plants, right? Uh, this would be a good thing, correct? Purely from a, purely from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, right? Are there any downsides? Are there any negatives to some of these large-scale dams? Yeah, biodiversity may be affected because you have to chop down a lot of trees, you have to flood a lot of areas. Um, although, if you think about it, strictly speaking, biodiversity uh, isn't, uh, isn't, as far as I know, one of the measurables in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Right? You think about it, if let's say I get rid of one area that has a thousand species, and then I replant it with, let's say, trees of a single species that can generate, uh, you know, that can, that can be better carbon sinks compared to what was there before. It's a good thing for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not so good for biodiversity. You'll piss off the conservationists. Yes. <laughs> so that's why when you all go and listen to some of these things that are being discussed in COP22, you need to realise what are, what are, what are uh, the, the terms on the table. Right? So biodiversity is one. Uh, but there's there's also there's also uh, you know, other downsides displacement of people, 
many of the natives were displaced uh, because they had to move out from the area that was flooded as a result of Bakun. That is not counted as a cost under, under your, your, your greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, these are human costs. These are the social impact. Uh, but it also has other environmental costs. Uh. For example, yes, when you clear land and you replace it with a dam and you, you know, flood, flood areas, you're taking away carbon sinks. Right? Uh, so that, that, that needs to be taken into account as well, uh, which I think uh, may be not really fully reflected in the INDC. Okay. Uh, so that's that's it on uh, SEDA and renewable energy. I think it's a good introduction to you guys like, in terms of what SEDA is. You need to maybe do a little bit more research and look at that a little bit closer. Uh, maybe you can ask for an appointment to go and visit them. I think through PowerShift. Uh, I think that would be quite useful for you guys to talk to them and to get, and get a sense of what they're trying to do. Okay, one last thing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, data out there which uh, is useful useful for you guys to have. So one data source is uh, something that I asked uh, Nasha to work on, which is the Malaysian Environmental Quality Report. Right? So this is pre prepared by the NRE, Natural Resources and Environment Ministry. Remember, it's not KETA who is the main ministry that is in charge of coordinating INDC. It is this ministry, uh, Natural Resources So you can take a look. Not all of it will be relevant to what you guys are doing. Uh, you know, so for example, ambient noise monitoring. That one, not so directly relevant to greenhouse gases. But for other things like uh, uh, air pollution, marine, marine pollution, yeah. uh, these are things that would be useful. And then you can track the status of, the, uh, of these things over time, 2011 to 2004. There's also uh, other NRE data that you can have access to. You can go to. Uh, Yeah, you can go to the Pusaka Media and then uh, you can go to Penipetan Jabatan. These are the different uh, agencies that are under the NRE that will be useful in some areas. Uh, management of rivers, water, uh, natural environment. The Hilitan has got to do with uh, wildlife. Jazz is Jabatan Alam Skita, Department of Environment. And all these. So there are a lot of good data sources out there. Uh, the, the question is actually what, uh, what do you actually do with the data? The different statistics that I've collected over time as well. I can pass it to Nasha and she can uh, go and uh, upload it for you all to take a look. Okay. Uh, any questions that you guys have in terms of environmental policy that you are interested in and uh, perhaps they didn't cover? Still processing, is it? Yes. Uh, <coughs> I, I've read the statement from last year. Uh, my sense is that it's too generic. Uh, and there's nothing, nothing concrete. Lah. So I think that perhaps could be driven by the fact that maybe uh, the participants in last year's MYD were not so sure of the details of each particular area. So my suggestion would be that maybe you pick about two or three areas that you're more interested in and then give some more specific policy recommendations. I mean, if you want to talk about waste management, you know, whether it is 
ensuring that you build a certain number of uh, sanitary landfills and then you c capture the methane or the gas emissions, uh, you know, other related recycling policies that you want to propose. Give something specific. Mm -hmm. Even for, you know, for public transportation, How do we want to propose an increase of carbon intensity cut up to 80% as proposed last year? Like, um, how can we propose this in a, in a feasible way? Like, yes. like, of course, we would like to look at, to get the, the scientific uh, evidence, like whether this is possible or not. And then, uh, are we able to achieve the carbon intensity cut of 45%? This is as promised in uh, INDC. Mm. And then uh, also we are looking at uh, increasing the renewable energy portfolio to 40%. And what, what, is this re realistic and then given current and near future energy profile? Uh, then we would like to look into... Uh, in terms of enforcement, uh, how can we preserve intact forests? Uh, it's still a need to clarify uh, each type of forest, uh, natural forest, secondary, primary, or uh, do we want to clarify on forest cover? Uh, I, mean, I mean, this is how they, I believe, some, most of our Malaysian minister of, of politician they mentioned uh, forest preservation in terms of forest cover. What, what? Also include plantations, yeah. And so, is is there a need that we want to clarify these things? And I think that's an important point. I mean, yeah. uh, you you guys have discussed that particular point before, right? So, it is to me like, It's kind of dumb to classify plantations as forest cover because if that's the case, I'll do exactly what I said just now. Uh, you know. No, not even plant whatever. I, I go to Taman Negara, I cut down all the trees there, and then I plant it with, uh, with palm oil. My, cloud cover, uh, my, my forest cover doesn't change. Right? But it's, it has a huge impact in terms of uh, biodiversity and, and other environmental concerns as well. So, uh, if, you want, if you look into that, then uh, you may want to look at some of the different uh, definitions that even maybe some of the different states may use. You know? The, the issue, as far as I know, may be more complicated than just uh, you know, all palm oil is considered as forest cover, but a lot of it is. So, yeah, so that one, it, it is an issue, it, it is a statistic which many politicians, uh, including the environment minister, brings up, but it needs to be uh, dissected and clarified. Yeah. So, I, 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 should, I think that that's a good issue to bring up. And then one more? Uh, then uh, there's this clarification on LUCF, land use, land use. Uh, land use. Land use. Land use. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think this one can part under yeah. the, the clarification. And we would like to bring up the FIGI tariff and renewable energy policy and action plan. Uh, like what's, uh, what is the current status? Uh, we understand that uh, previously we, we have this project under NAMA nationally appropriate uh, mitigation action under the UN, 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 uh, UNDP project uh, program and then we finished kind of completes last year. What about this year? What, uh, what's the progress and what we propose to do next? And then uh, about illegal logging, uh, I'm not sure how we want to package this thing nicely because we think that illegal logging it, it is linked to a lot of uh, inefficiency in flood mitigation, in uh, conservation, in uh, food security, and also uh, water security. And just to make it like how this can be done nicely and mitigate that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, you look at the cases in Kelantan. That's a good example. Uh, so the four aspects of yes. the proposal, The first one is the the ratification. No. You're talking about like uh, amendments and specific provisions of uh, uh yeah. of law. So we were wondering if like those from the law backgrounds could um, sort of scrutinize the, the acts. Like yeah, the I think that would be good. Acts yes. And see how effective they could be. Uh, how effective and then also maybe some of the implementation of uh some of these laws, uh, in terms of the power it gives to the minister to, let's say, declare an area to be a state or a national park, you know, for example. And uh, you want to propose something about marine ecosystem conservation and uh, protection, which uh, is totally not mentioned in the MPC. And I think you mentioned about the terrestrial park. And but you, you know, the minister... Uh, if I can anticipate, like you say, look, uh, protection of marine sources has no impact on uh, uh, GSG. How would you respond to that? But climate change is not necessarily just GHG, GHG though. It's because, you know, the phytoplankton in the ocean and that whole and ecosystem contributes to the carbon sink. So yeah. if ah, okay, you can argue from that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you can you can Not bring up the argument, yeah. I think it would be quite useful. There's yes. also the marine pollution from the MQ report. Yes. And uh, talking about certified forest area, uh, in terms of logging, how much uh, of our forest is actually sustainable managed? Uh, how much of the forest products are actually sustainable uh, certified uh, under EFC or FSC? And suppose the illegal logging, you know, we go under yeah. um, land use, use of land. When you're clearing up the land, so you're either doing it for the oil palm industry or the you know deforestation, so that would be that would fall under uh, illegal logging. So I think it would fall under the meaning of land use. And of uh, course, in terms of with that, another uh, main top main theme would be awareness. Uh, how can we promote and enhance? Climate change education. In the previous uh, youth statement, they have asked that uh, climate change is being uh, incorporated into the, the education program. But we, I mean, we, we've checked the latest. Yeah, uh, I don't think so. there's like, nothing there. And uh, can we propose something else like uh, maybe into the syllabus of the primary school? I was thinking of asking John and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, about yeah, in from TFM, right? So they would know what would be most effective and what is most lacking. Yeah, sure. I think that would be something more concrete la, rather than just to say put in the syllabus. Yeah. And then uh, uh, in terms of public access to climate change info, uh, under the clearinghouse mechanism Malaysia, we also we have a project under UNDP, it's National Access and Beneficial Network. We don't know about the progress of it and yeah, the data part uh, yes. needs to be more transparent. Yes. And then uh, about green uh, procurement, about uh, the whole idea of life cycle analysis, whether this could help the whole, invest, the whole uh, about the sustainable products. Uh, yeah, this would be an obligation on, on the corporations. Uh. Yeah, this will be part of the uh, transition. Sustainable products. And, uh, and I mean, you can even go further, you can ask uh, you know, all the publicly listed companies uh, to produce their own uh, you know, uh, carbon assessment, so to speak, their, car their own carbon footprint. Some of the larger multinationals have, have tried to do that. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the securities. Uh, the Bursa is trying to do something like this. 
but on a voluntary basis. Uh, Busa. Uh, Busa, Kuala Lumpur. Mm. Mm. Uh, under RMK 11, uh, this, how, how can we use the use of this uh, the, the strategy? Mm. I think it's under 11 strategy. One of the thrusts, la, the strategic yes. shifts or something. Like yeah, how can we relate that and use that? So one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is that, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of topics that yeah. we're looking at, yeah, uh, and we're um, there's 14 of us. Uh, that's the maximum, but participation-wise, yeah, we are trying to maximize participation as well. But uh, we probably have to get the youth statement done by mid-September, second week of September. So you have about one month to do it, lah. Is it? You you break out into sections lah, and then yeah. you know allocate the tasks, yes. and then whoever comes up with whichever group comes up with the stuff, that's what you will incorporate lah. Because there'll be some people who would do less work, and then if you think that the outcome is not up to grade, then you just leave it out. Would <laughs> you be willing to uh, look at it? Yeah, yeah, I'd be willing to give my input. It's not an issue. Um, yeah, so I th I think you guys are more or less on the right track. Uh, the, 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 the challenge is always there's more documentation and more and that, uh, more uh, stuff that you can read than you have time for. Uh. So mm -hmm. I think you should try to break up the task as much as possible. Before I forget, I think uh, Jasmine, you mentioned your interest in uh, seeing how science gets translated into uh, policy and maybe some of the politics behind it. There's this, uh, there are a couple of uh, quite good reports by the International Panel for Climate Change, IPCC. So they've published uh, a couple of different things uh, that I've seen. So climate change, the overall report, then uh, adaptation, vulnerability, mitigation, the physical sciences. And then there's, if you're really interested, I don't recommend it for, for others, like you're really interested, then there's sort of like a, there's a political process that's, that, is, uh, that happens even in these IPCC gatherings whereby there are different countries that are lobbying for their own representatives to be named as head and also part of the different working committees. So I think uh, it's usually, uh, you know, there's usually a sort of like a developed country versus developing country kind of clash. Uh, and they have to try to find a middle ground on that. The other thing that I wanted to highlight was uh, there's a... Uh, there has been two reports by the Ministry of uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment uh, that are of relevance to you guys. Which is, have you seen this before? Second National Com Com Communication to the UNFCC. You've seen this before, right? So they are in the process of preparing the third, the third one. one. So you know about it, lah. Yeah. Uh, you've discussed this within the group, right? So yeah, you should. You should see what Adrian, how Adrian can help out in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, getting you all up to speed with some of the details of the third uh, communication. A uh, couple of last things. Uh, so. Under the under COP twenty one, the developed countries are supposed to contribute about hundred billion US dollars a year for mitigation measures that that would help developing countries. Uh, that the mechanism to get spend that money is through the Green Climate Fund. 
course, the developed countries have not committed anywhere close to 10 to, to US 100 billion, not even in one year. I think they have about 10 billion US dollars that are in this fund. It's based in uh, Korea, and you can actually find a list of their projects, uh, mostly from developing countries. And guess what? Malaysia does, does not have any submissions. Uh, okay, so a lot of the submissions on, on the part of the developing countries, as far as I know, is being done by consultants, World Bank consultants, uh, private consultants from places like PwC and whatnot. And they are being paid to do these consultancy projects uh, to enable these countries to have access to those funds. I think Malaysia is at the point, at, at the point in our income level where um, the government may not feel as if we need to apply for this kind of funding. Uh, that's one. Or, number two, the ministry itself is not at a stage whereby it has, the, has enough technical capabilities to apply for this funding. So I'll bring up this issue as one of the parliamentary questions that I will submit end of the year to Parliament. I'll be interested to see what the ministry says now. October, right? The next yes, October. So you guys may want to follow up on this. As well, the green climate fund. Okay, last thing on uh, before I forget on the, the feeding tariff, uh, you can Google something called net metering. It's something that is going to be introduced. Okay, that's me again. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this net metering system is something that uh, is, has been proposed by SEDA. Uh, industry people are largely supportive of it and it will replace the feed-in tariff. Uh, what, this, what net metering is basically, once you install a solar panel system in your house, you can automatically sell excess energy back into the grid without needing the without needing uh, the quota or the feed-in tariff. Uh, that means the Naga will have to pay you directly. So this is still has to be negotiated between SEDA, the Energy Commission, as well as, uh, as, well as Tanaga. Because for Tanaga, they are afraid that this will result in less revenue and profits for them. Which is probably true in the short run. Uh, because, you know, I can generate electricity on my own and sell it back to you and you are obligated to pay for, pay for me. One of the advantages that I argue here is, is this. Right? So, even though the stock capacity in Malaysia is 21 gigawatts in 2014, peak demand was 17. There were times when the TMB had to burn more expensive oil distillates because some of their coal-fired plants were not operational. And this happened, uh, so, so this is the good and bad thing about the, those big coal uh, power, power plants. You can generate a lot of electricity at a very affordable price, but sometimes they will break down. And, and this goes into another complicated area whereby there's only one company in the whole of Malaysia that has the license to import coal from overseas, which is a company that's owned by Tanaka. Sometimes there's a lot of corruption involved in terms of importing coal. Uh, the grades and, and different things that may affect the, the operation of these uh, co-fired plants. So, um, so having net metering basically is a safeguard. If let's say any of your plants break down, you don't have to burn expensive distillate. You can depend on the grid to generate, uh, you know, uh, generate electricity that can be used by uh, you know, other parts of whether or not Tanaga buys this argument, I think it really still still up for up for debate. La. But this is something that you all should be aware of when you talk about when you talk about the FIT. Because net metering will eventually replace FIT if the industry uh, industry's viewpoints are taken to account. Okay, I think that's about it for today. We've gone through a lot more than I expected. So I hope that this gives you an idea into the nitty-gritty. La. All the areas that you talk about just now, you need to go and do a lot, lot more research to go and look at the nitty-gritty and then come out with specific proposals that can, that can
that can be helpful uh, in terms of uh, helping you think about these policies and then also helping you think about proposals to try to, uh, to, try to implement these policies in Malaysia. And then with that, all that background information in, uh, in, in the back of your minds, when you go to COP22, you are plugged into the larger debate uh, on environmental issues that's happening you know, uh, around the world and also at the global stage among the big players. Uh, so without, if you don't have this kind of background knowledge, when you go into COP22, you just be, it'll just be a big blur because there's so much you know, uh, information that's being, you know, that's being uh, put forth uh, at these kind of international conferences which assumes a certain level of background knowledge. Which so, Adrian said that uh, it's good to uh, try to read up on everything when you have to have a base understanding so people just to pick a topic each and go in depth in it and then follow that topic in COP22. Which is why your submission is, your MYD submission is useful as a useful framework. So you will go and specialize in your own areas and then when you go to COP, you know certain areas better than others. So you just try to monitor those areas and then come together to share the information. Yes. Uh, I have a question, uh, Neil. In two of your media statements, you mentioned that uh, Malaysia submitted its uh, INDZ pretty late, right? Compared to the other uh, countries. And uh, it was one of the reasons given was that they, uh, they were consulting a contact group in Dubai. Yeah, yeah. Do you uh, want to elaborate a little bit more? Okay, so the, there's, there's a lot more, there's, there's, there's a longer history behind this uh, lack of capacity in Malaysia, especially in the Natural Resources and Environment Ministry. Uh, firstly, they were plagued by a terrible minister for about two or three years. Like. This was under Palanival's time, the MP for Cameron Highlands and the former president of MIC. He basically didn't care about his portfolio. Uh, and uh, during that time, this was during the, in the, in the run-up to COP21, you know, uh, he, yeah, I think he did a terrible job. Uh, by the time the new minister came along, one ID, this was sometime in the middle of last year, during the cabinet research shuffle, when Mohidin was also replaced as a deputy prime minister. Um, uh, you know, he had very little time to try to catch up. Like. And uh, he was depending on the civil servants to want to, 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 uh, to come up with the INDC. And uh, he gave an excuse in parliament when I was asking him this question. Why we, are we so late? He said, oh, you know, I went to Dubai, had a contact group there that were discussing some of these uh, uh, larger, larger global issues of mitigation. So I wanted to have their input before we did our INDC. Actually, that's quite, quite silly because the INDC is, is purely local. Whatever is happening in other parts of the world actually shouldn't concern us that much. Do you we suggest that hmm? they are listening to other stakeholders? Like, they're not really stakeholders, but I suppose industry players, so like because of their views with maybe countries like Dubai. Well, if you look at the INDC, is there anything that reflects any consultation with the other stakeholders? The answer is no. So that's a poor, poor, poor excuse. Um, the other reason is uh, the other reason for the lack of capacity is that a couple of the very capable uh, DGs, the director generals, had retired, uh, and the person who's actually heading uh, this uh, climate change negotiation within the ministry is somebody who is actually seconded from FRIM. He's uh, now, I think, deputy DG level. Uh, I think he's, he's uh, uh, Dr. Gary Tessera. Yeah, so he's the point person, right? And uh, I, I think he's, he's uh, fairly capable. But he's only one person. Given the fact that climate change is such a wide topic, right, you actually need a good team of people uh, you know, who can actually coordinate the, the discussion and to be able to bring uh, not just your ministry on board, but other ministries on board as well. Right? So once you have a weak minister or minister who basically doesn't know his portfolio very well, he won't be able to coordinate all the other ministries to be on board on the same page. Right? So you need, uh, you need the coordination of uh, KETA, very important. You need the coordination of uh, MITA, uh, sorry, uh, MITI, in terms of, let's say, your, your, um, your, your automotive, automotive plans. You need the coordination of the Prime Minister's office because SPAD, public transportation, that's under the Prime Minister's office. You need the coordination of the Ministry of Transportation. Right? So all these things require, you know, not just the input of the other civil service, you need the input of the other ministers as well. And basically, during this time, I think, uh, the minister in question, two ministers in question dropped the ball and 
because you have very uh, you have very weak ministers coordinating this, then Najib won't won't try to get involved already. He wasn't even at he wasn't in Paris. Yeah, that shows you the priority level that you know that he holds. No, exactly. That should be our main priority as Malaysians. That that is that is what we should be concerned about. At mo uh, uh, you know, that should be the utmost priority. Whatever we negotiate, manage to negotiate in terms of mitigation and adaptation from the part of the LMDCs, it may not benefit us directly. If let's say we transition into a developed country status, that's what I've been trying to argue. That's what I've been trying to even argue to Prof. Goodyear. Uh, but Prof. Goodyear is under the impression that whatever commitment that was made under COP twenty one. We will still be able to uh, benefit it from it, from the perspective, from the the position as a developing country. I think that can be contested, and the green access to the green climate fund is one very good example of how I think we will actually not be able to benefit from. It. But at the end of the day, uh, you know whatever whatever that's being discussed at COP, I recommend very strongly to you guys that you still have to come back to the Malaysian perspective and see number one what are our targets and then number two to are those targets realistic targets that to reach and then number three uh, what are the mechanisms that we are putting in place to monitor and to ensure those targets are, are going to be met because if you look at some of the press statements by the Prime Minister we already reached like 33 percent in terms of reduction from our 2005 targets so to reach the additional two percent without the ten percent climate fund, fund uh, access to the the the, 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 the uh, you know, financial uh, resources that is supposed to come from overseas, getting to the additional two percent should not be too difficult. So we get to that two percent, then what else? What, you know, what else are we going to do? <laughs> In regards to the green, uh, the green climate funds, right? Yeah. Um, um, is it something that can only be uh, engaged between like the Green Climate Fund and the government, or can it be through like any independent or private bodies? Can, for instance, the Penang State government up the step and maybe come up with some proposals? Actually, that's a good question. I should look into that. Uh, I I think the um, from what I see now, the gov the submissions to the Green Climate Fund have been by national governments. I don't think like NGOs have applied for that funding. Uh, I'm not sure whether they can or not, uh, but the, the more relevant question to Malaysia is whether the state governments can apply to those funding sources. So, you know, Sabah, Sarawak, Penang, Selangor, you know, for, for different reasons, la, for different reasons. Uh, Kelantan, you know, for flood mitigation uh, technology that they may need. Okay. okay, I think that's about it. I think, you can get my email from Nasha and then uh, you can you can continue the conversation and then I'll give her some more data for her to upload upload to your, to your group. Yes, <laughs> Yes. Oh yeah, um by the way, uh of course uh Adrian isn't coming but he asked me to complain. Uh, on behalf of him about what his face no water. water. Yeah, I, yeah I, know, I know, I know, I know. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so I think we can gather around him and then with the FYD plan. Someone wanna hold it up? Yeah, no, I, I, I think them, I mean this one. Oh no, actually I can actually call someone. <laughs> Do we have to take this off then? So we can hold it instead yeah. of Using the NYD. Our ship is relevant, so right? <laughs> NYD, that's right. Yes, NYD, that's right.